Don't demean your worth or denigrate your contribution because you're unique. You're irreplaceable. At times like that, just look up and leave. It's up to us to go down the road that leads us back home. It's up to us to see we already are what we want to be. Don't give in to what others say. Welcome to the Worth of Souls podcast, Lesson 6. I am Andrea. And I'm Brent. Don't ever forget what Elder Holland said. You are unique. You are irreplaceable. In the lesson today, we're going to be talking about how we can view everything in this world as a stewardship. We are almost halfway through this podcast series. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh, it's awesome. Haven't we learned so much together already? At the beginning of these podcasts, we talked about the purpose of these lessons. And that is for each of us to become one with Christ by learning to see, think, feel, and do as he would. And how do we do that? By understanding our current thought habits if we are spiritually centered or temporally centered, and then changing those hot thought habits to become more like our saviors. Each lesson up to this point has given each of us the opportunity to see how we can change our thought habits to match the saviors. And we've asked you to practice applying these principles as we've taught them along the way. By way of review, we want to go back and look at at those lessons and really congratulate you on how much you have already learned. This is our cheerleading session. You'll remember in the first lesson that we introduced you to the three worlds we live in every day and mentioned that it is our responsibility to choose to either be temporally focused or spiritually focused. Then we talked about the story of Nephi being tied to the mast, the principle that he understood that if we're spiritually centered during adversity, we release the power of Christ and miracles can occur either in our external environment or within us personally. And then we introduce the power of praise and the concept of praying always in order to start seeing as Christ sees. Then we talked about Alma's process of change and understanding the process it takes to plant a seed which is, you know, a thought or a question, and then experience the confirmations from the Holy Ghost and how when we experience the Holy Ghost, we feel the swelling feelings and the enlightenment of our mind and enlarging of our soul and how it just becomes delicious to us. Then we introduce thought habit number one, that the Holy Ghost can confirm every day that I am on the path. And we talked about how the celestial kingdom is the easiest kingdom for you and me as Latter-day Saints to qualify for. We went into detail about the process of justification and the magnificent role that the Holy Ghost has in our lives. In thought habit number two, we talked about separating our worth from our performance and developing high feelings of self-worth and that we were never sent to earth to prove our worth. And then in, in thought habit number three, we discuss the performance cycle. The performance cycle. <laughs> and where we get stuck in a temporal focus compared to using performance the way we're supposed to, to glorify God, to become like Jesus Christ, to qualify for grace, and to qualify for the riches of eternity. And can you believe how far we've come already? And we're only through thought habit number three. <laughs> In these first few lessons that we've already covered, it can feel a little bit like when you go to an uplifting seminar or a conference weekend and there's so much new information that you've committed yourself to applying. But then regular life sets in and you realize a week later that you're hardly doing anything that you promised yourself you would. You can tell I've lived that program. (laughs) I've been to many of those seminars. (laughs) It's easy to do an overwhelm. At about this point in learning about these thought habits, especially realizing that there's still nine more to discuss and to learn. And if you're feeling that at all, remember what we have said all along, that this life is not about perfection. It is about progression. If you apply one thing you learn after each lesson, then you are making progress Don't give up. Brent and I have been learning about these thought habits for 20 years. And we can tell you, just like the analogy of the spinning plates, 
there's always one that's slowing down and that needs our attention. And the spirit is going to guide you as to which thought habit you need to be working on right now. That's right. If you study one thought habit per per week for 12 weeks, you will be able to go through them four times in a year. And if you look back after that year, it will blow you away the progress you have made toward becoming like Christ. We hope that in this process you are feeling more joy in your day because of being more spiritually focused. Please let us know on our Instagram and Facebook about any experiences that you're having becoming more spiritually centered and seeing things the way that Christ sees them. Let's get into thought habit number four. Everything in this world is designed for spiritual growth. There isn't anything on this earth that isn't designed for that purpose. One of the questions that this lesson is going to answer is, how can I see all things spiritually and still carry out all my temporal assignments with everything around me in the temporal world? Let's talk about a doctrine of the gospel that's very familiar to us, especially those who have received their endowment in the temple. We want to present to you that if you follow this particular point of the gospel with your spiritual eyes, you'll be able to carry out all of your temporal assignments with a spiritual focus. It is the doctrine of the law of consecration. What the law of consecration basically says is that everything I have or ever will have belongs to Heavenly Father. Those of us who have received our endowment, we've also made a covenant about this law that we will consecrate our time, our talents, our possessions, everything to him. Now, some members of the church think that it is a promissory note. (laughs) In the legal world, a promissory note is a legal document promising to provide a service or fulfill a contract. Like I might give you a promissory note together with $5,000 that states I will purchase your home before the end of June. The law of consecration is not a promissory note. (laughs) So many saints think, I'll give him everything if God asks for it, or as soon as the prophet tells me to. And since he hasn't directly asked me that yet, then it's still mine. We want to be very clear. This is not what the law says. Elder Neal A. Maxwell addressed this in his talk, Consecrate Thy Performance. He said it beautifully this way. We tend to think of consecration only as yielding up, when divinely directed, our material possessions. But ultimate consecration is the yielding up of oneself to God. Heart, soul, and mind were the encompassing words of Christ in describing the first commandment, which is constantly, not periodically, operative. We may, for instance, have a specific set of skills which we mistakenly come to think we somehow own. If we continue to cling to those more than to God, we are flinching in the face of the consecrating first commandment. Brent's favorite is Maxwell. I love him so much. (laughs) I miss him. Everything in this world is already his. He doesn't have to ask us for it. And you will find living this law in your mind and heart is the easy way to get through this life. It is the easy way. So everything is already owned by God. And he then turns around and gives me responsibility or an assignment over what is in my possession. What is that called? Stewardship. We are stewards over his possessions. So what are our stewardships? We want to go over some of them very quickly with you. Our assets, like our house, our car, furniture, investments, retirement, savings, piggy bank. Yet your retirement is actually not yours. It's God's. (laughs) Our bills. Did you realize that our bills are also stewardships? Medical bills, house payments, car payments, working with the IRS, everything like that. Our relationships. My spouse, my kids, parents, siblings, nieces and nephews, grandchildren, friends, and our bodies, the food we feed our bodies, exercising our bodies, keeping my body clean, showering, hopefully, putting on deodorant, like sleeping, our hobbies, our callings in the church, leadership callings, teaching, primary, cleaning the church building on Saturday morning when you don't want to get up (laughs) because it's the day you get to sleep in. volunteering at the cannery, everything that way, and our job in our community, our time at work, relationships with coworkers, 
community theater, volunteer efforts, politics, etc. But most and most especially, our time also belongs to the Lord. Elder Cook reiterated that all of these are our stewardship assignments. In his talk, Stewardship, a Sacred Trust, he said this. In the church, stewardship is not limited to a temporal trust or responsibility. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, we are stewards over our bodies, minds, families, and properties. A faithful steward is one who exercises righteous dominion, cares for his own, and looks to the poor and needy. I love it when modern-day apostles and prophets quote apostles and prophets who have passed away because it reminds us it reminds us that all of these things are timeless doctrines. So why is it important to view everything as a stewardship assignment? Because he is the master of the vineyard. There are obviously many parables that Jesus gave us that talk about this principle. The first one we'll look at is the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. You'll remember that in this, the master gave three servants differing amounts of talents, and then he went away. When he returned, he asked for an accounting of what the stewards had done with his talents. The first two had multiplied their talents. They had been good stewards, but the last had hid the talent he had been given and was pronounced a slothful servant. My good friend, Gainalyn Condi, recently finished a book called The Stewardship Principle, Reframing Your Life. And her book is all about stewardships and what it means to let God be our boss. And go get it. If you really want a deep dive into stewarding, as she calls it, go get the book. She recaps this particular parable very, very well. In the book, it says this, quote, But what of the third servant? Maybe it was fear or shame that led to his choices. Was he stuck in the trap of comparisons, wondering why the master had given others more and he was assigned only one? Did he doubt strength, intelligence, or abilities? Whatever the reason, this servant decided to bury his talent. A modern-day translation of this scripture would say something like, I trusted you to consecrate what I gave you. I trusted you to share it. For in sharing, you would have received more. But hiding what you have been given has caused you to lose it. End quote. She then goes on to talk about this idea in a very brave way <laughs> and talks about how this is taught in 12-step recovery programs and that to keep your sobriety, you must give it away. Have you ever thought of an addict having a stewardship of addiction recovery? Hiding an addiction for an addict is death, but going to meetings and sharing personal experiences that strengthen others, it's a huge way to help them keep their sobriety. My sister Danny has shown our family about the beauty of having a stewardship of being a recovering addict. She is constantly openly sharing her path of addiction and recovery. It is a huge stewardship for her. She doesn't own her sobriety. She's constantly giving credit for it to God that he gave sobriety to her as a gift and she gets to watch over it. Most of us wouldn't compare drug addiction to one of the talents in the parable in the Bible. It is a very out of the box comparison. But this is how it is with all of us in whatever weakness we might struggle with. Those weaknesses are stewardship assignments. That's right. When we share our experiences with others, not to get people to notice us more, but with the motivation to glorify God, then that particular talent that God gave us, even if it is having recovered from an addiction, can become a very special stewardship assignment. It's very popular right now to be, quote, vulnerable. (laughs) But we must always ask ourselves, what's our motivation for being vulnerable about whatever's happening in our lives? Is it to receive recognition or is it because we view our journey as a stewardship and want to glorify God by letting our light shine? We are the only ones who can decide where our hearts are within this idea. The next parable we'll look at is the parable of the laborers in Matthew chapter 20. 
see if you can identify where the laborers had what we call an ownership problem. In this parable, the master of the vineyard hires different laborers throughout the day to work his land. And at the end of the day, he pays them all the same, even if the laborer had only worked for an hour compared to those that had worked all day. The laborers that did work the whole day, they thought that they had been wronged and they confronted the master of the vineyard. And he reminded them that they had agreed on a price before the work even began. And it was his right as the master to pay everybody as he saw fit. What did the laborers see as theirs? What did they own in this? They had an ownership problem over their time and over the decisions of the master. And we're not so different from them. How often do we try to take ownership over what we feel like the master should be doing for us or the way we think he should be answering our prayers? Everything is his. I'm just a worker in his vineyard. And I'm going to check in with him first to see how he wants me to handle my stewardship assignments in his vineyard. It's just like when you work at a job. You talk with your boss about how he or she wants you to carry something out. It's the same pattern with the Lord. He's our ultimate boss. What did we learn last week? That our performances are to glorify God, to become like Christ and to build up the kingdom. None of my performances are to build up and glorify me when I'm spiritually focused. It's the same thing with stewardships. All of them are to glorify God. And what's the opposite of stewardship? Well, we've already mentioned it. It's ownership. ownership. We have a problem in this temporal world of ours. That is that Satan tries to convince us. Very effectively. Very, very effectively. <laughs> that everything that we have is ours. Mine. We, we actually learn this as infants. What is usually one of the very first words that a baby learns? It's mine, especially if they have siblings. Yeah. <laughs> try, try to take away something from a toddler. What's the, what are they going to say? Mine. That's that's the one of the first words they learn. When we buy a home, it's ours. We own it. Or we think, right? Or we think we do. <laughs> it, our car, anything that's in our possession, we think we own it. But guess what? That is one of Satan's great lies. It is not our home. It's the Lord's home. It's his car. It's his food storage. We are just leasing all of this stuff while we're here on earth. If in my heart I believe I have ownership, then it is very hard to focus spiritually on my temporal world assignments. Yes, it is a lot harder. It's a lot easier to really grasp this concept with an example. So let's jump into a, a simple example with my neighbor, Brother Smith. Brother Let's Smith. call him Brother Smith. <laughs> so Brother Smith comes one day and says, hey, Brent, can I borrow your vacuum? And I have a good relationship with him. And so I say, of course, you know, take it for as long as you need it. Then when the vacuum comes back, the next day I try to use it and I discover it's not working. And I do everything I can think of, but it's obviously broken. And I find out that it's going to cost $50 to repair the vacuum. Under stewardship, using a spiritually focused mindset, it makes no difference to me if I use Heavenly Father's money that is in my bank account to fix the vacuum. Or if I go to Brother Smith to ask him to use Heavenly Father's money that is in his bank account to fix the vacuum. It makes no difference the source. So after discovering the vacuum is broken, I go to Heavenly Father's bank account in my name to get the money to fix his vacuum. And I have no animosity about this whatsoever. I am doing this for him. It's his vacuum. I can follow through with the stewardship feeling just fine without hatred towards Brother Smith. What major law have I just followed in this situation? I've gotten the beam out of my own eye first. If I have no animosity and no need to go to my neighbor to demand his money to fix the vacuum, then I have no beam in my own eye. I have removed it. What if the Lord tells me, Brent, Brother Smith needs to help fix the vacuum. Will you please go ask him to use my money from his bank account to contribute? So I go to my neighbor and I talk to him about the situation. If I have removed the beam out of my own eye, and if I have no need to demand my neighbor pay for the vacuum, 
how will this situation change because of my emotional state? When I act as a steward for Heavenly Father, I have no need to win. I have no scarcity in my mindset about One the of situation. The greatest thing, scarcity leaves. Exactly. It's, it's awesome. And I can act out of complete abundance in my heart and mind. Now, what if I go to Brother Smith and he refuses to help? Maybe he says, I don't think I need to help because your vacuum wasn't working that great when I used it. And I don't think we broke it. I didn't go to my neighbor to win or to try to force him. I went to serve Heavenly Father because the Spirit asked me to. My neighbor can tell me no, and I can still respond in love because I have removed the beam and I'm acting as a steward. There are some people who really have an issue with getting into this mindset. Why? Because like in this example, they want to teach responsibility to Brother Smith. They got to teach him a lesson. <laughs> they take ownership over the vacuum, but also over Brother Smith's response. But is that our job or is that the Lord's job? When we go to force someone or when we expect a specific reaction and don't get it, those are clues that we are acting from ownership, not stewardship. We must have the Holy Ghost with us in situations like this. And when we, when we react out of frustration or anger or malice, feeling that we need to win and he needs to lose, then we have an ownership problem and we are going to lose the spirit. In an ownership paradigm, when we go to Brother Smith, that conversation would take a negative dive. We would demand he help to pay for, the, for fixing the vacuum. We would accuse him of ruining our stuff then of course he's going to react and disagree and argue. And that is exactly how fights between neighbors start. Yeah. And they can last for years and years and years. And all of a sudden you don't remember why you were mad exactly. in the first place. Exactly. And ultimately the most important thing is it drives the spirit out of our lives when we do this. Yeah, exactly. Another reason that came to my mind that some have a hard time wrapping their heads around stewardship is they feel like that they'll become a doormat and people will just take advantage of them. But guess what? We are never taken advantage of because God also loves boundaries. He's the most boundaried person in the universe. I can never become a doormat because I use everything and every situation in my life for spiritual growth. And with this mindset, there's there's always room for a win-win, you know, as you know, Stephen Covey calls it. And I will never allow someone to misuse me because I pray and I get direction from the Spirit before I make choices with my stewardships to keep the beam out of my eye. That's right. So if Brother Smith comes at a future time and wants to borrow my carpet cleaner, what am I going to do? I will act within the boundaries the Spirit directs me to act with. In the moment he comes over, I will immediately go into prayer and ask Heavenly Father if he wants Brother Smith to borrow the, his carpet cleaner. It's Heavenly Father's. And if the Spirit tells me no, then I tell Brother Smith, oh, sorry, I won't be able to. And But if the Spirit says yes, he can borrow it, then I'm going to let him use it because I don't own anything. It's all Heavenly Fathers. And when I interact with my neighbor, I, I need to communicate as the Savior would. And being in a stewardship paradigm makes it so much easier to react as, as Christ would in every situation. Let's add to the story. Let's say the bishop calls you after like a month of the vacuum incident and says that they need help buying a vacuum for the church. Their vacuum broke and they're a little short on funds. And he knows that, you know, maybe you're in a position to be able to help and he wanted to reach out. Then how would you respond to the bishop? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, sure, bishop. I'll be right over with a check. Yeah, yeah exactly. And after the conversation with the bishop, like, how do you feel about it? Well, I feel you, great. You feel good because you want to help. The, what the bishop didn't tell you is that Brother Smith broke that vacuum from the church too. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't I don't in that scenario, I don't have any issues paying for the new vacuum because in my mind that's the Lord's vacuum. And he's come to me and asked me for help through the bishop. It's not a promissory note anymore. But can you see how it's still potentially an ownership focus unless I feel that exact same way about my own vacuum, that that is also the Lord's. That's the exact same paradigm I can be in when I'm acting as a steward over all that he has given me. 
When we act as a steward, it is amazing what happens in our lives. We adopt a huge abundance oh, mindset. Yeah. The abundance that comes is phenomenal. And we have no problem with boundaries because the Spirit directs our actions and we know everything belongs to Heavenly Father. No one is going to be able to take advantage of me because I don't own anything to take advantage of. Yeah. And at this point in, in the lesson, if you feel triggered or you just can't imagine adopting this mindset, I invite you to ask yourself why that might be happening. Most likely, it is because you have an ownership mindset over something or someone in your life. The Lord is inviting you to live a different way, and he will keep trying to teach this principle of stewardship to you your entire life. He's going to give you lots of chances to practice. <laughs> He'll keep sending Brother Smiths into your life <laughs> until you learn the stewardship principle. Yeah, that's right. The Lord taught me and Brent about stewardship in a very big way. We were renting a house in St. George, and the landlords decided to sell it. When they told us, we, of course, started looking for other places to move, and we looked and looked, and every time we tried to find another place, the Spirit kept telling us, no, no, not there, nope, not right. And it was, it was shocking because no matter where we looked or what we did, it just it wasn't right. Then the Spirit started whispering to us that we needed to sell or give away everything and to only keep the things that we couldn't replace. And I remember when I was getting those impressions and I was like, oh, my gosh, Brent's going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> when I tell him my impressions about this, I was really nervous that that he was just going to think I was nuts, that I was thinking we needed to sell everything and give away everything. But, but guess what? <laughs> I was getting the same impressions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like he told me. I've been feeling the same thing. I was nervous about talking to you about it. So we started the process. We started selling everything and giving everything away. We knew the concept of stewardship, and we thought before all this happened that we had done most of the work to just consider everything uh, stewardship. Um, and that if the Lord came to us and to ask us to give up everything, that we could. This process taught us that we had a much bigger ownership problem than we realized. The most painful experience in this whole situation, honestly, was when we gave away our food storage. We believe very deeply in preparedness, and we had worked for years to build up a really good food storage. If you're looking at the slides, the picture on the bottom with the truck and the trailer, that's, that's well, not our food storage. It's the Lord's food storage. That's what we ended up um saying goodbye to. And I remember when I had the conversation with Brent about what to do with our food storage, and he looked at me and he just said, Andrea, it's Heavenly Father's food storage. We can give it to whoever he recommends. And so we prayed about it, and we were told to give our food storage away to Brent's sister. And when she and her husband traveled to our house, and we packed up everything in, in the truck and trailer, our hearts initially were in like panic mode. Ooh, my heart was racing. We hadn't been without food storage our entire marriage. Our entire marriage. And as I watched the hour, what I, you know, had in my mind, our food storage drive away down the street, it was that that was challenging for me. But then when Heavenly Father's food storage turned the corner and was out of sight, Brent and I both looked at each other and the greatest peace came over us. We had no negative feelings. The Lord had designed this perfectly for our spiritual growth and to see if we would be steadfast when the adversity came. This whole process really taught us about the stewardship principle. And we had to really dig deep and admit to ourselves that we had so many more attachments than we ever wanted to admit. And we had dedicate our, dedicated our lives to doing what the Lord would have us do. And he really, truly wanted to test us to see if we were willing to follow the Spirit and the Spirit's instructions. Now, I know some of you are wondering, well, if you sold everything, then where the heck did you go? <laughs> the Lord told us to go to my parents' house, and he gave me the greatest gift to spend what I didn't know would be the last three months of my mother's life 
on this earth with her. I got to spend that time with her. And that is a gift I will be grateful for for the rest of my life. Now, the Lord knew that all of this was going to happen. And I would sell and give away all of our stuff over and over again in order to receive the gift of those last few months with my mom. It was so amazing to see so clearly God's hand in our lives as those months at Andrea's parents' house went by. You guys, God is good all the time. All the time. We all have lots of opportunities every day to practice using stewardship. Let's compare the difference between ownership and stewardship feelings within a couple of everyday circumstances. What about when you feel like your spouse isn't paying attention to you? Under ownership, you're going to blame them. You are going to be critical of them for what they're doing or not doing. You feel like you deserve better. Maybe you self-condemn and you say things to you in your temple like, they just don't want me to be with them anymore. Or you, you maybe let irritations build up over and over again so that it gets to the point that it just explodes inside of you. But on the other side, when you act as a steward with your spouse, you recognize the feelings that they aren't paying attention to you, but you take it to the spiritual dimension and you talk to Heavenly Father about it, saying things like, Father, she is thy daughter and you know what's going on. Help me to see her as thou sees her. Then you get to be spiritually focused before having that conversation about those tender feelings with her. And you're going to take the beam out of your eye first. Another example may be that you have a child that is struggling with their sexual identity and you are taking ownership over what have I done wrong as a parent or ownership over the ramifications of this in the child's lives. When you view your child as a stewardship, you are able to be an instrument in the Lord's hands and find out how he recommends you help and love your child. Another example, maybe you've been promoted at work and you have an ownership problem over feeling vindicated that you finally were chosen over that awful coworker, John. But as a proper steward, after receiving that promotion, you would glorify God. And, and then take John out to lunch. <laughs> take John to lunch. <laughs> Perhaps you have a neighbor like Mr. Smith or <laughs> Brother yeah, Smith. Brother Smith. <laughs> <laughs> you have a neighbor who's always finding fault with your lack of tidiness around your house or your terrible landscaping, and, and you take ownership over their feelings. But under stewardship focus, you're going to recognize that that home is the Lord's home, and you're going to follow the Spirit about how He wants you to take care of it. Now, I've got a really good example with noticing ownership feelings. What about when we get into a car accident? doesn't even have to be a big major one, just a fender bender even. Under ownership, you immediately feel anger towards either yourself, if it was your fault, or the other person who crashed into you. You react with frustration, stress, anger, or shame. But under stewardship, you can transfer your feelings to the spiritual dimension and say within yourself, Okay, Heavenly Father knew that I was going to get in a car crash today, and it was going to ruin his car. He could have inspired me to go somewhere else, but he didn't. And then with those thought processes, you can go into prayer and talk to him about how, Father, this is thy car, and the other person is thy child, and you knew this was going to happen. Please help me to handle the situation acting as a steward over this car. What about compliments that you receive on your recent weight loss. Like you remember when we went through that in detail when we talked about separating your worth from your performance. And when you view your body as a stewardship, it's much easier not to get hooked into the flattery coming from the world. Another situation that really can hook people is when church callings change. There, there have been people in my family that have been stake presidents and in regional so-called big callings in the church. And then after they were released, they got called to the library or the nursery. <laughs> and they were offended by that, quote, demotion within the church. And when you have feelings like that, it's an ownership issue over your callings. Elder Uchtdorf told a perfect story about this concept with um, callings in the church in a recent conference talk. He told of a stake president, Brother Myron Richens, 
And this stake president was extremely involved in planning the celebrations for the 150th anniversary of the pioneers' arrival in the Salt Lake Valley in his little town of Hennifer, Utah. Elder Ukdorf goes on to tell us what happened. Just before the actual celebration, President Richard's stake was reorganized and he was released as president. On a subsequent Sunday, he was attending his ward priesthood meeting when the leaders asked for volunteers to help with the celebration. President Richards, along with others, raised his hand and was given instructions to dress in work clothes and to bring his truck and a shovel. Finally, the morning of the big event came and President Richards reported to volunteer duty. Only a few weeks before, he had been an influential contributor to the planning and supervision of this major event. On that day, however, his job was to follow the horses in the parade and clean up after them. President Richens did so gladly and joyfully. He understood that one kind of service is not above another. He knew and put into practice the words of the Savior, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. What a profound example of someone who understood a stewardship in his church calling. Yeah, I just, I, you could picture it in your mind. We can look at our stewardship responsibility over our bills. This is a very effective source of doing battle with the struggle between stewardship and ownership. Do your bills belong to you or to Heavenly Father? They belong to Heavenly Heavenly Father. Father. They're all his. <laughs> They're all his. When I change my paradigm and look at my bills as a stewardship, it transforms my attitude and my responses. Acting under stewardship, you talk to the spirit about who needs to be paid first. And if you're behind on your bills and you have bill collectors calling, when you stay in stewardship, you aren't afraid to talk to them because it's all Heavenly Father's money. Yep. Now, we give these examples because most of them – Andrea and I have personally experienced or someone very close to us has. And we can tell you with full confidence that acting as a steward is a better way to live. It's a better way to live. All of these experiences in, in life are set up for our spiritual growth. My, my sister Krista has a saying that she always shares. She, she's always saying, God knew this was going to happen. So I suggest you get your lessons. Yeah, I love that phrase. I say it to my kids all the time. I'm like, Krista says, it's not me. It's not your mom. It's your Krista. (laughs) That phrase is perfect. Orson Pratt also said, covetousness is that which leads to ownership. When I take ownership over my money, my spouse, children, my time, my body, that I'm choosing to rely on myself. And that is a fast way to temporal focus. When I rely only on myself, I get really hooked by outcomes, by how my children are doing in school and whether or not I have enough money, by the outcome of how my body looks. I get hooked into seeing my happiness and my success, my very life dependent on the outcomes of temporal achievements. When we live the law of consecration, it's about consecrating all of my efforts and everything in the temporal world to God. I let go of outcomes. Acting as a steward over my family, my spouse, and my time, my money, etc., I go to the spiritual world in order to get instruction about all of these things. And then the outcomes, that's in God's hands. He inspires us how best to respond when I view everything in my life as a stewardship. And... Is everything in my life something that he chose to allow me to have or experience? Well, yes, everything is. And does he care if I look at all those different things in my stewardship as assignments? Yes, he cares. One hair of my head does not fall without him knowing about it. He asks us to look to him in every thought. He tells us that time and time again. Because he knows that we can't do this life without him. Without him, The more I view everything that he's given me as a stewardship, the more spiritually focused I become and the more enjoyable my day becomes. A friend of ours, Peter, who put together the manual Becoming Christ-Centered, shared a wonderful story that perfectly depicts the power of acting as a good steward for the master of the vineyard. He says this, quote, Abby was an independent exuberant teenager. 
and she had been looking forward to driving for years. When she finally got her license, she couldn't wait to start driving the family car on errands and and to activities. About a week after she got her license, her mother asked her to run to the store to pick up a few things. Abby had only driven alone a couple of times before, so she looked forward to the opportunity to run the errand for her mom. Everything went smoothly as she drove to and from the store. As she parked the car in the driveway, she accidentally pressed the accelerator instead of the brake. Dun, dun, dun. In an instant, she realized her mistake, but not before the garage door had, had a van-sized dent in it. She cried and cried and worried about her father's reaction when he arrived home. After what seemed like hours and hours, Abby's father arrived home. He had recently learned about the concept of stewardship versus ownership. He gathered Abby in his arms as she sobbed and apologized. I'm sorry, Dad. I ruined your garage door, and the van has a dent in it, too. Her father gently replied, I don't have a garage door, Abby. I don't have a van, either. Abby grew quiet. That's Heavenly Father's garage door, and his van, too. You are worth far more to him and to me than any garage door or van. Abby's sobs intensified. And instilled in her was a certainty of her Heavenly Father's love for her as well as her Father's sense of love and stewardship for her learning and growth. Why was her Father able to respond with such patience and love? He had very little emotional attachment to the garage door or the van. He had made efforts to establish that all he had really belonged to Heavenly Father. He had stewardships for those things, but Heavenly Father could let anyone that he wanted to improve or ruin those things. He could have kept this incident from happening, but he did not. Instead, Abby's father recognized that Heavenly Father had chosen to allow him to grow spiritually. He gave him an opportunity to choose to be temporally focused or spiritually focused. He gave him an opportunity to see as Christ sees. Oh, I love that story so much. I mean, what an amazing emotional deposit that that father was able to give to his daughter. That probably filled her love bucket up for the rest of her life. Years, (laughs) yeah. Because he focused on stewardship and not ownership. Let's look at Alma's process of change for the concepts that you've learned today about stewardship. The seed we're inviting you to plant is God owns everything, and I am choosing to see everything as a stewardship from him. So first, awake and arouse your faculties to see as Christ sees. Once again, we have provided a list of scriptures and talks to use during your study time, specifically that are about stewardship and the law of consecration. Please review the scriptures, but also try to go to the temple. Make an appointment and listen to what the Spirit tells you about consecration within the temple walls. And if you can't make it to the temple, we invite you to review in your mind and heart the verbiage of what the Lord tells us there about consecration. Second is to exercise a particle of faith, to think as Christ thinks. You will, of course, want to pray about your stewardships, but specifically, we want to invite you to make a very detailed list of everything you have owned in the past. Very detailed. Include everything, everyone you have relationships with, any assets, bills, items, time commitments, callings, health challenges. And after making this very detailed list, take it to the Lord in prayer and tell him you are deciding to consecrate all of these things to him as his steward. Say in prayer that you know that he owns everything on this list. Then ask him to inspire you as to how you need to carry out these stewardship responsibilities. This is a powerful exercise. I really encourage you to do this. And we've place also, it on the altar. Yes, in place, front of place him. it on the altor. Yes. We have also included for, for a helper some prayer phrases in our, in our sample prayer that we provide on our website. Third is a desire to believe and let this desire work in you to feel as Christ feels. As you pray throughout your day, you can receive a witness by the Spirit about everything under your stewardship. Once again, pay attention to those swelling motions, the enlightening, the enlarging, the all the ways that your stewardships that can become joyous to you. And then use the eye of faith to see the fruits of this principle. By seeing in your mind 
how the Lord has handed you everything. Some A practice that I have that's very powerful for me is I picture the Lord holding my children as they sleep. And then as the day starts, that he hands them to me for the day. It helps me remember that they're his kids. And picture the Lord saying to you, as he said to his wise stewards in the parable of the talents, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We do have a beautiful meditation that goes along with this lesson on our website. Please go check it out. The fourth step to Alma's process of change is to give place for a portion of my word by doing all of these things out of the love we feel for Heavenly Father and our Savior. So in this time that you give yourself, do the searching and the pondering and the praying because you love him. And don't cast out by your unbelief. Satan is going to attack you. Remember that. He had... An incredible he had a ownership major problem. Major ownership problem in the pre existence. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Big time issues. He wanted to own everything and everyone and receive all of the glory for it. So you can expect him that he is going to tempt you with ownership issues when you are trying to overcome this and trying to overcome the world and trying to unhook yourself from ownership. Expect those attacks. And as he attacks you, use the confirmations of the Holy Ghost that you've received as your shield of faith while you fend off those attacks. Don't cast your confirmations out by your unbelief. Use those confirmations as battle armor. Seeing everything in our lives as stewardships is the Lord's way and it is the easy it way the to easy live this life. Way. It Please. is the abundant it way. It is the abundant way. Please give yourself a few days to apply this what we've talked about today before going on to the next lesson, which is going to be thought habit number five. And until then, always remember that the worth of your soul is great in the sight of God. The Worth of Souls podcast is not an official publication of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you have any questions about the doctrines discussed here, please visit the church's official website for clarification.